Pop Health Week on Healthcare Now Radio. Today's episode is sponsored by Health Innovation Media. We bring your brand messaging alive on the ground and now in the virtual space for major trade show conference, innovation summits, and webinars via our signature pop-up studio. Connect with us at www.popupstudio.productions. I'm Greg Masters, Managing Director of Health Innovation Media, publisher of ACOWatch.com, and your Pop Health Week co-host with my partner, co-founder, Fred Goldstein, President of Accountable Health, LLC, a Jacksonville, Florida-based consulting firm. On today's show, our guest is Christine Monkhouse, MPA, CEO, and founder of Patient Orator, a digital health startup empowering chronically ill underserved patients with effective communication tools and healthcare resources. We discuss a range of topics in the social determinants of health domain, from implicit bias in healthcare decisions to empowerment and shared decision making, as well as Christine's documentary film, Humanizing Healthcare a narrative-driven, emotionally-paced documentary about healthcare experiences in the United States. The film explores deeply rooted systemic issues across the healthcare ecosystem and the barriers they present to people at each touchpoint in care delivery. For more information, go to www.filmfreeway.com forward slash humanizing healthcare or for the app www. Dot patientorder.com. So with that introduction, Fred, over to you. Help us get to know Christine. Thank you so much, Greg. And Christine, welcome to Pop Health Week. Thank you for having me, Fred. <laughs> it's a pleasure, Christine. It really and thanks so much for joining us. It was, we had a fantastic conversation about a week ago, and I'm so glad to get you on the Pop Week. So why don't you give our audience a little bit of uh, your background? Sure. Um, So my name is Christine Monkhouse. I am the founder and CEO of Patient Orator and a producer of a short documentary titled Humanizing Healthcare. First and foremost, I love healthcare because it is the only industry that I can think of that touches all of humanity. Therefore, it has the capacity to bring us together as a society, as a collective, and as individuals. And I think that COVID-19 has highlighted its importance. My background is that I am a public administrator. I specialize in public health. Most of my experience in healthcare has been on the front lines. I worked as a nursing assistant in college, and I later became a care coordinator prior to founding a patient orator. In the nursing assistant role, what I saw was firsthand how silos impacted patient experience in that the patient's voice were left unheard. And I also saw that the healthcare workers were restricted based on limitation in time and the great burden of documentation that they faced. And so from a system standpoint, each stakeholder were at friction with the other. So the patient being at friction with the nurse, the nurse being at friction with the MD, MD at friction with the administrator, and so it continues. But on the flip side of that is my experience in working with underserved populations, which exposed me to a different set of frictions in the healthcare setting or in healthcare ecosystem. That is related to the issue of resource limitation and the lack of care coordination and poor patient experience based on where a person lives, their race, and their income. And so eventually I was overwhelmed and I had this voice telling me that I needed to do something because I was morally conflicted about the fact that I couldn't do more for the patients that I was caring for. And I ultimately made a decision which I thought is an ethical decision to help bring the issues of poor patient experience, of caregiver experience, and also bring the voices of folks from the front lines and those in policy to speak openly about disease and illness, not only from the problem standpoint, but also from that of of what are the solutions and how do we address these issues. And that really is the birth of Patient Orator, which uh, was originally intended to be a place to amplify voices, uh, patient voices, through video discussions. So you start Patient Orator, and what is Patient Orator now, and what have you created with that? And so one of the things that's happened is 
as I was building this story bank of um, stories from all across the United States, I became ill, and I found myself on the receiving end of the very that I was advocating for, which in essence is equitable health for all. In my case, I was left undiagnosed and untreated for chronic pain uh, issues for over a course of three years. And during that time, I was seen by over seven different specialists before I was actually treated. This experience truly opened my eyes to the importance of not only documenting these issues surrounding poor patient experience, surrounding poor um, health outcomes, but also creating practical solutions to um, address these issues. So in 2019, I had a light bulb moment that brought me to realize our new mission, um, which is around empowering underserved chronically ill patients to better communicate their symptoms, to better improve their health literacy, and to connect them to those services that will help them achieve optimal health through a mobile health app. And we're currently in private beta, uh, and so there's a lot uh, that is being developed as we speak. That's fantastic. So the issue you really felt was the ability of an individual to better tell their story to their physician. Is that fundamentally where this is going? Yes. Um, One of the things that I saw was patients, sometimes there's all kinds of dynamics within these healthcare settings, a lot of which are systemically at play, um, deeply rooted racial issues, and and I'll get into that when I speak about the documentary. But there's a lot of different dynamics at play, and sometimes, uh, again, going back to restrictions around time, the lack of interoperability within these settings, uh, resource limitation. Patients are really limited in how much they can communicate and, and how well they communicate. And on the other side of that, seeing uh, the clinicians having these barriers, how do you help a patients to tell their stories effectively when they're in those settings? So it doesn't matter what race, class, gender they are, they're able um, to effectively communicate what the problem is so that the clinician can uh, treat them appropriately. Yeah, it's really fantastic. I know when we were doing our Medicaid disease management programs, that was, you know, one of the issues we saw with these lower socioeconomic groups was that there were sort of the two sides that you mentioned to their story, the one side of uh, being able to communicate it effectively, and the other side is to be able to take the time and yeah. hear and respond to that appropriately, and we see problems on both sides of that today. And, and I guess that's sort of what you experienced in your three years journey with your pain issue? Yes, yes, yes. So with, with, with my issue, I didn't realize that it was ongoing for three years, of course. It wasn't until I was in a crisis that I realized, holy cow, like no one has been paying attention to me. And luckily for me, I Googled. I gained the help that I needed um, and was able to be treated. But in my own self-awareness, I look back on the encounters that I'd had, including the trip that I had to do, to the emergency room, and I question how was it that I was communicating to the physician versus the aide versus the nurse or the respiratory therapist, whomever I was encountering, there was different ways in which I was uh, communicating. And every time I spoke to someone else, I would share a different piece of my story that I might not have mentioned to the other uh, the other party. And so those are things that I examined as to going back to that light bulb moment of are we communicating in a way that fosters this environment that is just so restricted around time and all of these other things? Are we communicating as patients effectively when we're encountering in these settings? How are you seeing that? You mentioned early on the, the COVID issue. How are you seeing that play out? in these various communities in terms of COVID. Obviously, we're seeing much poorer outcomes from those in the lower socioeconomic groups. Is this a piece of that? So a a little piece. I think, first and foremost, Patient Narrator's app is going to solve for some of the issues of, of health disparities, but it won't solve for all of the problems. So I'll use my aunt, for example, who lives in Brooklyn, and um, she had started experiencing uh, COVID-19 symptoms, and she went to her local emergency room. She had expressed very clearly that she had an issue, that the symptoms that she was experiencing aligned with what was instructed to be symptoms to look for. And she was turned away from her emergency room because she was not critical enough. And so when you look at where she's located in comparison to someone with uh, more money or people that are wealthier, 
And the experience that they will encounter, it will be two different experiences uh, where as even though she communicated very clearly, she did not receive the help that she needed because of the issue of access, because of the issue around limitation in resources, et cetera. And so some of it is being played out around, yes, the patient should be communicating more effectively or they can learn to communicate more effectively, but then we still have those systemic things, those systemic barriers that really regulate the quality of care patients will receive. Right, and that really gets the social determinants of health, which is this is you know, one of the pieces. And when I talked about the issue of if that's part of the, the, the problem that's going on, it wasn't from a patient perspective that they're not doing it right, but that the system is yeah. able to communicate effectively with them. And there's been this ongoing discussion about whether or not this should be something that the health care system really brings that level of communication down to where the patient needs it at their appropriate level. So really fascinating. And how are things going in New York right now? Well, it's it, from from my understanding, having family and friends um, that live in New York City, um, I know that there's an increase in testing sites, so that's very good. From a resource standpoint, I think having having the testing available is one of the major steps in which we can help to bring these numbers down for people um, that are diagnosed or, or for people to be even uh, diagnosed. And so those are some, some key things that I, I think is really good. I think also there is this saying of New York tough. New York is a community unlike no other community that I've ever experienced, and I've traveled all around the country. In times of stress and crisis, it's just this amazing feeling to see people come together and be a part of of the solution rather than a problem. And so for everyone who has been abiding by social distancing and practicing social distancing, I'm really, really, really impressed and really um, grateful for, 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 for what we're doing as a collective. And if you're just tuning in, you're listening to Pop Health Week on Healthcare Now Radio. Our guest is Christine Monkhouse, CEO and founder of Patient Order, a digital health startup empowering chronic wheel underserved patients with effective communication tools and healthcare resources. Christine is the producer of Humanizing Healthcare, a narrative driven, emotionally paced documentary about healthcare experiences in the United States. That's great. It really is part of, it's also part of your humanizing healthcare documentary. So can you talk a little bit about that documentary? How did that go on? What made you decide to do that? And uh, what are the Yes. So humanizing healthcare is inspired by my experience on the front line, um, having seen high hospital readmission rates among poor folks and people of color around witnessing abuse in healthcare settings and knowing that we all care about fixing healthcare, but we're operating in silos. So the film itself is a narrative-driven, emotionally paced documentary about healthcare experience in the United States. It explores deeply rooted systemic issues across the healthcare care ecosystem and the barriers that they present to people at each touch points in care. It was produced by myself, so everything you see is 100% a reflection of my experience on the front lines like I mentioned before. And it really highlights the patient, the frontline healthcare workers, the policymakers, and just everyday Americans as they navigate the healthcare system. And what you'll also see is the emergence, or what you'll also learn is the emergence of institutionalized healthcare uh, within the United States. And Americans really calling for humanizing healthcare. Um, as a person, it is my belief that every single human being ha- have a voice that matter. But as we navigate the stressors of our own lives, of our work, in addition to navigating the societal pressures of expectations and, and other things that, that may come along our path, we become apathetic to other people's experiences. And I saw this firsthand in working with nursing, working in nursing homes rather, um, with patients that were being abused, where the workload was an issue because administrators prioritized cost savings over the safety and well-being of not only patients but those that care for them. And ultimately, when you watch Humanize in Healthcare, you will learn, you will feel, and you will be equipped with some tools to take some steps to 
whether you're a patient uh, to be able to be an active participant in your care or whether you're a provider to have the the perspective of the other person who might be the patient um, or even be uh, more aware of how health plans work or any, or, or any of those instances, for example. And in essence, the film talks about things that you won't learn at healthcare conferences. And these are some uncomfortable conversations around bias in medicine and highlighting how healthcare costs impact patients of diverse backgrounds. In essence, it's really a tool that brings awareness to social determinants of health through storytelling. Yeah, it was, it's really uh, great. I happened to watch the whole thing. It was very well done. I can't imagine how much time it took you to actually do that. And perhaps we can get into that a little bit. And I also noted sure. that you had Dr. Lisa Fitzpatrick on there, who we had on the show a few weeks ago as one of the people you interviewed. And obviously, she's in a similar space trying to solve these problems. It's also fascinating. You mentioned this when we were on the phone call, that where are the conferences that discuss this stuff? And yeah. I, I just thought that was... <laughs> So true in healthcare. We have all these big conferences. How many of them really get into these issues that are really fundamentally impacting individuals' health? That's a very valid question, and I don't know if it was a statement, but I can tell you last year I must have went to over seven different conferences, if, if not more. And I can recall there was a social determinants of health panel at HIMSS, and, and, and they spoke about uh, access and how uh, where people live, work, and play impact their ability to access health care. And I remember that very distinctively because I was immediately drawn to that kind of conversation and discussion. But I, I don't recall other places that facilitated these conversations. And I know for a fact that I haven't seen any conference where we had or, or where, where the organizers had people really describing um, from from a very humanistic standpoint of how these these um, these these silos and these issues impact their experience to obtain health, and from really using that diverse perspective. And so, what you just brought up was it was excellently stated. Well, thanks. And so, for your your film, where do people go to find that? Sure. So the film can um, be rented on Vimeo, and it is available worldwide. Fantastic. So you it's called... essentially type in um, Humanizing Healthcare, and it will pop up. Uh, producer is Kissy Monkhouse, and you can also find it on Patient Orator's website, which is patientorator.com. That, that is great, and I would recommend people watch it. It really was very insightful, and you really talk to people throughout the system, like you talked about, from patients to physicians to policymakers, and it, it really does open people's eyes as to what's going on. And in terms of that, you mentioned nursing homes as one of the things that was uh, sort of draw, drew you into this, and you also mentioned the issue of nursing homes and costs and controlling costs, and... We've seen what's happening right now in COVID, mm -hmm. particularly in the nursing homes. Is this really one of the underlying causes of why we've struggled with that group and they've been so battered by this illness? I don't have the answer to that, but I, what I do know is that if people have loved ones living in or residing in um, long-term care settings, that really I would just say check in on your loved ones and don't leave them isolated. Oftentimes abuse is something that is very common, but it is not um, being spoken of. What COVID-19 did was brought it to the forefront. The issue around, let's say, for example, cost savings, prioritized safety and well-being that I spoke of earlier, that's a real thing. And what it results in is patients um, not having the quality of care that they should be having. Um, and again, COVID-19 brought that forward, but it's really our individual responsibility to not depend on the system itself to autocorrect, but to correct them by making sure that we're doing our job, our diligence, and calling and finding out from our loved ones or getting to know who the nursing staff is. Being an active participant in your loved one's care, I think it will be, um, it'll be, it, it will make a huge difference, at least from a very micro level. And getting back to your, the app, you talked about it's in beta now. What exactly does it or will it do once it gets released out, and how does that work? Sure. Um, so what it will do is it will help patients uh, narrate their storytelling. It will help them track their symptoms. It will help them uh, store their symptoms securely. And really, there's, there's no existing 
app in this space that is addressing the issue of social determinants of health uh, and literacy uh, by addressing illiteracy and communication. So we're really looking at addressing root causes of health disparity from a holistic standpoint, ensuring that the patient um, knows how to tell their story effectively. They have a place to, to securely store, track, and record their symptoms, um, that they're improving their literacy, um, and that they are connecting to those resources that, that, that they need. And as you take this message out, you've talked about this broader message that includes the app, humanizing healthcare. Are you finding receptivity? Are there places where people are willing to listen? Is it health systems or employers or other groups? I think people are more receptive now that COVID happened, which is a shame, really. And when when we look at the spending in the U.S., $35 trillion in 2018 alone, and I think there was a study that was done that shows that a 68 percent of patients had at least one challenge um, or one social determinants of health challenge, um, which may be financial, housing and security, transportation, food, et cetera, et cetera. I think that there should be incentives around solutions that are solving for these problems. So value-based care being increased in across the healthcare ecosystem is great. But we also need to look at folks like myself that are developing tools for communities that we've uh, worked in or or, ourselves are a part of. Receptivity should be there. Um, But, yes, there is more receptivity now because of COVID-19. And and, and I am very um, enthused about um, solving for these issues. Yeah, as am I. I think it's unfortunate that COVID-19 has brought this to the fore, but I think it's given us a much bigger voice regarding this. And I think you meant $3.5 trillion for the annual spend in the U.S., which is certainly a lot of money. And I know we got involved in discussion the last week on yeah. this issue of value-based care and whether that's where we can find the funds for helping with social determinants of health. Are you seeing more interest beginning to come around in terms of either shifting money or finding money to help solve these problems? Yes. Um, so there is a lot of a lot of call for innovation right now, even as we speak, um, to solve for these issues. Um, COVID-19 really exposed these underlying issues in regards to healthcare disparity. And I love to see that, that health systems, that payers, provide, everyone is really trying to solve for these underlying issues. And I think it will take a collective effort in order to really address these issues. So I'm very appreciative of the fact that there's an uptick in technology and spending around solving for social determinants of health. So where are you going out to um, to take your message? Who Are there certain groups you're talking to or places you're targeting as you try to uh, move this along, both from the you know perspective of your company, your film, and just the broader issue? Obviously, it's, it's embedded in you. Are there places you're yeah. going out to? Yes. Yeah, so I am really looking at the folks who are already in the space solving for these issues and who may be a complement uh, to the technology that I've created. And also looking at the payer system and the provider system, looking at the communities that will um, ultimately benefit from the product itself. So there's there's a wide variety of stakeholders that I'm approaching as a startup. Um, I think the first place that I've looked at was really the, the key players that are already in the ecosystem. And did you, as you started this company up, did you have some funding angels or others help you out to get this going? Have you just bootstrapped this? Where are you with that? I think we know we, I bootstrapped it. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, no one wrote me a check and said, hey, Christine, we want you to solve for social determinants of health because we're passionate about this issue and we know that it's important. No, I took that upon myself because it it, it is not right that people are being turned away from, from hospital settings because of where they live, that people don't have access to food because they live in a food desert or an area that has a food desert. It, these things are just, they're not right, and no one is going to solve for them because there's, there, well, up until very recently, there was really no incentives around solving for these issues. And so I took it upon myself um, because I felt a call in and I heard a voice say, you have to fix this. And from there on out, it's really taking steps 
to first prove that, listen, I know what I'm talking about. The data points to the fact that if we address these issues, that we'll have better health outcomes. And the journey has not been easy. It's constantly having to talk to people who don't understand it. They seriously don't get it as to why this solution will help or any other solutions in this area will actually help to address the issue of spending and improve population health. But I continue to do it because there are patients and caregivers who looked at the application and said, I would pay you money for this right now. And that says that there is a need. And because there is a need and because I've experienced the discrimination um, as a patient and the unequal access to care, I will continue to work towards um, this solution. However, if there is an angel investor out there that's listening, <laughs> yeah. I invite you <laughs> to reach out. <laughs> Well, maybe somebody will listen to this show and do it, Christine. I think you're fantastically oriented in a great space. Obviously, you're mission-driven. It's a critical area for this country to solve. And I just want to say I appreciate the efforts and the and the true passion you bring to this. I thank you so very much, um, Fred. I, I know when we spoke privately, I was amazed and impressed and just wanted to learn as much as I could from you as someone who's been around and has been doing this work. And I think it takes an army of people who have been doing the work and people who are energized now um, that want to solve for it. And it, it will also take a lot of change in minds and hearts. Um, and hopefully we can, as a collective, do that. Absolutely, and I can tell you from both Greg's perspective and mine, we're happy to get on your train and try to help move this thing forward. So, Christine, I want to say thank you so much for joining us this week on Pop Health Week. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. It's truly my honor. And back to you, Greg. And thank you, Fred. That is the last word on today's broadcast. I want to thank Christine Monkhouse, CEO and founder of Patient Order and the producer of the documentary film Humanizing Healthcare. For more information on the app, go to www.patientorator.com and follow Christine's work on Twitter via at Patient Orator. Finally, do check out the documentary film Humanizing Healthcare at www.filmfreeway.com forward slash humanizing healthcare. For Pop Health Week, my colleague Fred Goldstein and Healthcare Now Radio, this is Greg Master saying, Stay safe, y'all. We'll get better together if we toe the line on social distancing, proper hygiene, and by all means, wear those masks when in public. And do hold space for our collective healing. We have lots of work to do in pursuit of that more perfect union.